There we go. All right. Uh, I, I suspect many of you uh, have seen many of the slides I have uh, shared with you today. So I will actually go through a fast clip and uh, you know, try to fit within my 15 minutes uh, allotted. So really the, the question is, how do we find our way out of the Philippine recession? And what, what do we want to be arriving at when we find our way out? And I'll just uh, organize my talk into two major questions. Where are we now? Again, a quick rundown uh, on what exactly uh, the state of the economy is, but I will not uh, uh, dwell too much on that because uh, Asek Lambino, Yusek Lambino has already indicated to us uh, what these are. So I guess our better interest is in what lies ahead. Uh, let me get right to where it is. Uh, and I think many of you already know of my trademark PITIC test where we're looking at presyo, trabajo, and kita, prices, jobs, and incomes as the main uh, economic indicators that uh, the, uh, the ordinary Filipino can relate to. And of course, uh, many of you already know my color coding as well. And the good news in my slides will come in Ateneo blue and uh, the bad news comes in the, the green that torments our basketball team. Uh, the good news is, well, one of the bullets, which is inflation, because prices have remained stable. Our inflation rate uh, year to date remains 2.5% which is the same as it was for the full year last year as an average. The challenge really is in jobs, and we already know the statistic that we had 17.7% unemployment as of the April survey. And I'm eagerly awaiting, by the way, anytime now the, Ju the July survey figure should be coming out. Uh, but again, uh, there's been a lot of unemployment. It's uh, 7.25 million who are now jobless out of our labor force. And uh, the KITA part or income uh, is again the, the prominent news about the negative 16.5 second quarter contraction, which translates to a 9% uh, contraction for the first semester. So this chart shows you the roller coaster ride on inflation and how, even though uh, we have had a slight uptick lately, we're still averaging 2.5% on an annual basis. But here's the unemployment numbers, and you can see now the, the loss of jobs uh, split out by sectors where services has lost the most and uh, agriculture has lost the least. And that jibes with the fact, that, as you'll see in a while, that agriculture was the only positive grower in this past quarter. Now in this slide, I like to point out the quality of the jobs. And here we've lost the, what we consider the best quality jobs in the economy, which are the wage paying jobs, wage and salary workers declined both in number and that's almost uh, six and a half million workers uh, from the wage and salary worker category losing uh, their jobs. And the proportion also went down from 65.2 to 63.2%. And uh, in the own account workers of which there are two categories, the individually self-employed and the self-employed with employees, I like to think of the latter as really a real time, at least uh, with the uh, labor statistics, a real time count of our micro, small and medium enterprises, because that's what they are. These are small uh, self-employed people who have a few employees and therefore operating small businesses. So I think what I'd like to highlight here is that if you look between two th uh, January this year and April, we had already lost close to 400,000 of these self-employed employees, or we have lost that much of micro, small and medium enterprises. So this is disconcerting news, but of course, across the board, uh, we already have uh, job losses. And in fact, between January, by the way, and uh, April, the actual total loss was close to 9 million. You see, the, 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 what you saw in the earlier table was January a, a year ago, or sorry, April a year ago to April this year. But just between the first and second quarters, it was actually a loss of almost 9 million. If you look at the Kita part, again, we can see here the the, the performance of agriculture, which is positive, the only positive uh, performer among our three sectors this time. And by the way, they're usually are the, the, the laggard among the three major sectors. But now that we're seeing double digit declines in industry and services, agriculture actually shines. And luckily the growth rate is about equal to the population growth rate. So the, the theoretical share of each Filipino in the total national income has not declined since a year ago. The GDP growth, of course, is a double digit decline, as we have already said. No? But let's take a closer look at the agriculture. There's good news on the overall 
well, 1.6%, but there's still too much negatives. No? If you can see the positives here, the ones pointed with uh, blue arrows, I guess standing out is sugarcane, which actually grew by 76%. That's a zooming growth. And their problem right now is they're up to their ears in sugar. And uh, we really have to look for export markets because uh, consumption is down. But the other important thing, of course, is the 7.2% growth in Palai and 15.6% growth in corn. And these are, of course, the biggest, uh, along with coconut, uh, among the biggest uh, crop sectors in our agricultural sector. So you can see there that uh, that was enough to bring the, the, the agricultural sector to a positive growth. Now, if you look at industry, of which there are four subsectors, mining and quarrying, manufacturing, utilities, construction, it's all negatives and particularly double digit negatives, uh, except for utilities, because of course, we all still needed our electric power, our water, albeit still uh, a decline in the actual uh, uh, consumption of these particular utility services. Now in this slide of manufacturing sectors, this is usually in normal times, predominantly blue because you know positive growth manufacturing industries would dominate, but now it's only pharmaceutical products and refined petroleum, understandably, which have actually continued to have positive growth. And then pharma products, not surprisingly, faster than the, the usual GDP growth rate we have at 7.7%. But look at the, the rest of manufacturing down the line. It's all negative. Food manufacturers, although, again, that's something we don't expect to be affected much, still had a negative 9% or, or a decline of 9%. Still, that is the best performance among the negatives in the food and uh, in the manufacturing industries. In services, again, it's green. It's negatives across the board, except for, logically, information and communication. We still had to uh, be in touch, especially with internet. And of course, the banks and insurance companies continuing to grow. Uh, so government services had to be growing because that was the only possible way to pump prime the economy that's actually declining. Again, I like to point out how the financial services sector is always in a win-win situation. Whether the economy is up or down, it tends to do quite well. So uh, you know, some of you have already seen how I pointed out this 15 year period between 2004 and 2000, uh, uh, 2019, average GDP growth 5.8, average financial sector growth through that period was 8.9. Let me jump to the third bullet. Uh, in the second quarter of this year, it had, we had a negative 16.5 contraction as we already know, but the financial sector still expanded by 6.8%. And, and by the way, the measurement of that in the statistics is through the profits. Of the, of the banking sector. So not surprisingly, of course, the, the, the big banks have been disclosing double digit profit increases since last year. And so that's the reason why through thick or thin, the banks seem to win. Um, the demand side of the GDP is uh, also useful to examine because we can tell what, where the impetus to actually produce has actually declined. And it's actually predominantly household consumer spending, which is almost 70% of the total demand for uh, goods and services in the economy. And that took quite a hit, as we all know, negative 15.5%, which is something we have not seen uh, in, in recent history. In fact, maybe it's, I would suspect it was only in the, the World, War, uh, World War II that this kind of uh, dec decline in consumption spending really happened. But then again, you also see investment spending, which is that fixed capital formation negative 37.8. So that's really total spending in the economy, whether it's foreign, domestic, or whether it's government or private investment. All of that went down. You can see where the hits were, especially in household construction activity with a negative 70, 75% drop. And uh, the only positive investment component was again, agricultural invest, investment, reflecting the positive uh, performance of agriculture where you the breeding stock and orchard development grew by 2.2% in the second quarter. So some further indicators, uh, aside from the GDP, inflation, etc. Inflation is still here. Up to July, we have uh, 2.7, as I said. Uh, but if you look at volume of manufacturing and industrial power consumption, very closely related, there seems to be at least a tapering off of the, of the decline. In other words, the negatives 
are less severe compared to what they were in April. In fact, since April, the, the negative numbers have been getting smaller. And it's also worrying that the OFW remittances, which is a primary propellant of our consumer spending, which as you remember, I said it's about 70% of the total demand in our economy. The fact that it's declining, and you know, before we were only seeing um, growth rates declining from double digits to single digits. Now it's negative, meaning it's all dropping. And therefore what we see here is a peaking of that drop in May. Fortunately, by June, the number showed only a negative 4.2 drop. But again, uh, that is uh, uh, clearly affecting consumer spending in the economy. So if we uh, look at the rest of the economy, well, one of the first things that we ought to be uh, worrying about, I think, is that there's a steep slide in foreign direct investment, which otherwise would be uh, creating jobs in the economy. And this has been happening for three years now. And, and we peaked in 2007 with 10.3 billion US dollars. It dropped by 4.9% in 2008 to 9.9. It dropped by an even deeper decline of 23% in 2019, and guess what? In the first quarter of this year, it's an even steeper decline of 36.2%. And what's sad about this is that most of our neighbors are still having increases in FDI, especially cashing in on the exit of investors from China, especially uh, precipitated by the US-China trade war. We are not apparently catching on to that uh, opportunity. And therefore here we are all over again in terms of attracting FDI, at least among our comparable neighbors. So as I go to what lies ahead, I just ask two questions here. How do we speed up the recovery? And what should, what would, and what should our new normal look like? Well, the first question really is how do we restore jobs as quickly as possible? And the question to ask, which industries and which parts of the country account for the most jobs? Because you'd logically want to focus there. And then as far as restoring incomes or output, the same question, which indices, which areas of the country contribute the most to output and incomes? Well, here they are. The, the most important contributor of jobs is wholesale and retail trade. Now, that's not just the shopping malls for the retail trade, but also a whole lot of, again, individually self-employed retailers like your fishbowl vendors, your uh, balut vendors, and, and so on. But altogether, that makes up almost 9 million of our workers, or about more than 20% or more than one fifth. But next is agriculture, hunting, and forestry, which did post positive growth. And I, I highlight this because agriculture links directly also with the trade uh, industry, because of course, agricultural products have to be traded. It also links with manufacturing because the biggest segment of manufacturing sector is food manufacturing or food processing. It links directly with transport and storage because the agricultural products have to be transported and stored. And it also links with the tourism uh, and accommodation and food services industries because of the food requirements in these establishments. And if you look at the GDP contributions, manufacturing is the top contributor. And therefore, again, you would want to, uh, to restart the manufacturing sector, right? But if you look at this list, that, that uh, the things that near, are near the top are the ones hardest also to open up uh, most completely. Now, agriculture is there, but it's a, a little down below, except, as, as I said, I'd like to point out the linkage it has with manufacturing itself, with trade and repair services, with transport, storage, and communication. So that, uh, in the end, agriculture, and here fishing has its own category, could actually be an important contributor, not only directly, but also the indirectly to the re, re, revival of our uh, economic production and therefore generation of incomes. Now, if you look at the spending side again, what is propelling our GDP, the single biggest, as I already said, is household final consumption expenditure being adversely affected by OFW uh, reduction or actually falling uh, remittances. But uh, again, the other spending categories are durable equipment and which we know dip by uh, double digits, 33%, if I recall the number earlier. And so that means that we can't really look too much there. Uh, but again, the challenge is how do we uh, particularly provoke that very first figure in household final consumption expenditure. In terms of which areas to focus on to recover uh, most quickly, 
again, logically, you'd look at where the GDP is highest in terms of contribution and where the jobs are also the most concentrated. And that's really NCR, Metro Manila, Region 3 or Central, uh, Central Luzon, and then Region 4A or Calabar Zone. To some extent, of course, in the Visayas, the Cebu Region or 7, and in Mindanao, uh, the Dabao Region or Region 11. Uh, put in a map, it's easier to see uh, and appreciate the dilemma that we have. The, the areas of the country where the COVID incidents have been heaviest based on the tracking is these red areas in the map. But if you look at where the gross domestic product is or re gross regional domestic product and the population and therefore the workers, it's the same regions of the country. So the conclusion I get out of this is that the areas that can most contribute to restoring jobs, production, and incomes are also those where it's most risky to ease up. And that points us then to the countryside, the areas outside of these red areas where agriculture is the primary industry of, uh, of livelihood of the people. Now, how do we proceed with this uh, revival of the economy? Obviously, we have to have a phase reopening. The ones that had to continue even through the pandemic, it would again, agri, fishing and food and trade, healthcare, banking. The first to possibly reopen would be construction, even though that's troubled also. Among other things, the transport of the workers, the construction site has also been very difficult. Manufacturing, uh, I'm told that in the, in the economic zones, there have been a recovery of manufacturing activity. And then, of course, mining and BPO can also be reopened, but with the proper physical distancing. The reconfiguration of the rest of the economy will be in the form of scaling up. In the case of the winners, which are online retail, uh, our logistics supporting them, and of course, the internet services that support all of these inter uh, online services, including the ICT and online platforms like Zoom that has become so, uh, in fact, it's, it's Zoom, as, as you probably heard, Zoom is now more valuable than uh, several airlines combined. Uh, entertainment uh, platforms like Netflix and other artificial intelligence uh, platforms are now the ones hitting it big. But the ones that are really badly hit are restaurants, malls, cinemas, even spectator sports. You know, we're not seeing PBA basketball games these days, obviously. Uh, and then what's really happening almost across the board is more automation, more digital uh, technology being applied to our production and manufacturing, including in education, obviously, there's now distance uh, learning that's happening, other services, and including healthcare. Uh, telemedicine has become, has become very, very common now. At the same time, a lot more of work from home. And there are certain industries that can accommodate this to a large extent finance, utilities, business services, and so on. Now, the question might be, okay, we're talking about stimulus and allotting a lot of money. Of course, there's a debate on the amount. Uh, a rise wants 1.3, but the Bayanihan 2 has a, has a much more modest amount. But where do we really want to spend it? Because the question is, maybe it's quality, not quantity, we have to be talking about. Because, of course, our executive claims that there are constitutional limits to what can be spent. And you cannot just simply uh, legislate a supplemental budget without identifying revenue sources for the supplemental budget. And by definition, loans are not revenues. So this is really the constraint. So under that situation, we simply have to look at spending the money in a way that will really uh, provide the, the best, uh, the, well, the, you know, the best results, number one. Uh, we want to support essential consumption spending why? Because before you even give money to the small enterprises, you have to have the demand for their products and services to go up first. And that means you have to put money in people's back pockets. That implies more cash transfers to the poor and the displaced. And of course, um, even more prior is the testing, tracing, and treatment. We have unfortunately completely mishandled that. And that's why we are now uh, described again as the sick man of Asia Unfortunately, in, ad in additional literal sense, we're also the sickest in terms of COVID. And so it's correct that we need to con restore confidence, the confianza that the vice president was talking about before we can really enliven the economy all over again. So money has to be spent to do TTT, the, the three T's right. And then we support the purchasing power of the people. And then now you work on the supply side. Uh, and here is where assistance to small business 
is really important. And unfortunately, there's some are getting the, set, the impression that even more hurdles are being thrown in the, on the way of our small businesses, especially. They are being asked to shoulder the cost of the COVID test, which costs thousands per employee. They're, uh, they're asked to shoulder the cost of additional protocols like face masks and face, uh, face shields and so on. So, you know, perhaps what we could do with a, a, a good part of that stimulus is to provide free and widely accessible COVID tests for employees, especially of small businesses, and even subsidize those incremental costs that they incur for the new safety protocols they have to install. Of course, we also have to look at critically hit, critical hard hit large businesses. The airlines are really suffering and bleeding. Tourism industry in general, like hotels, except those who were able to become the quarantine hotels. No? So really, uh, this is really a, an extremely difficult task. And I guess we can put our heads together. And th that's the question. How do we spend that economic stimulus money to get the most bang for the buck, so to speak? Looking at the outlook, well, the numbers I crossed out here are what our projections were as of February before COVID struck. Now that's all thrown out the garbage because the jobs outlook is now going to be definitely double digit for the full year uh, in terms of unemployment rate, that is. And the GDP growth, uh, we estimate to be anywhere some in that range of negative six to negative eight. And I'll share with you some of the Ateneo macroeconometric model simulations. Uh, what we have showing in our model is uh, a little slackening of the decline, but a decline still in the third quarter, 11.8, and then uh, an improvement to negative 2.8. But the full year would be that it would be implied was would be negative eight, and we're looking to a 5.1 next year. Again, this is what our macro model says. I won't go through the rest of the the, the details here, and they're they're here for us to look at, and I think everybody will get copies of these slides later on. But as I just wind down, let me talk about the new normal. I think we all know what the features of that will inevitably be, including more physical distancing, face mask usage will probably stay on for quite a while, but there'll be a lot of closures, scale down uh, uh, capacities in many establishments, especially restaurants, cinemas, more work from home, and then of course more online retail services. Um, and by the way, because of all of this, perhaps there'll be a dampening of demand for public and private transport which we can't even restart at this point. Uh, this will all, all obviously raise the demand for internet services, e-commerce, ICT products, and the supporting logistics for the e-commerce. So again, those are going to be the winners. But the other thing is banking is changing its nature. It's now going to be a lot more digital and uh, the banks have to be nimble enough to adjust to that new, uh, new way of doing business. One welcome development has been more localized value chains more people even in the cities growing their own food in fact and there's more home food production this is welcome because uh, with shorter value chains we are now able to assure more st uh, stability of supply you know you don't have to be consuming vegetables that came all the way from Benguet. now you the, the people who actually are selling you vegetables via facebook or via text and they come to you to deliver it are usually from, uh, coming from growers nearby and of course more online learning and distance education now that's what would the new normal be like, but what should it be like? Well, I, I like to think these photographs capture what they are, but let me just say what, what I mean. More and better equipped hospitals, more testing labs, effective healthcare, effective uh, universal healthcare, more geographically dispersed economic activities, and less focus on Metro Manila, more dispersed urban centers, not even just Manila, Cebu, Davao, but even more, and less concentrated mega cities as a result. And because of climate change and, and, and sea level rise, a greater shift in the long term towards inland and to higher ground. Now, on the, on, on the sectoral uh, composition, again, I've already been highlighting agriculture. We have to diversify and modernize agriculture. We need to make it highly productive and competitive, like our neighbors, Thailand and Vietnam, have already demonstrated. Livable cities with a well-organized public transport, and I know MAP has... Uh, uh, hit the news recently because of our position on uh, how to reorganize our public transport, including hopefully more sustainable modes like bicycle and even pedestrian uh, friendly uh, transport. Uh, expanded and upgraded internet is uh, a given that we need to have. And again, how well we'll do on that remains up in the air. 
effective social protection, social bonding, not social distancing. And I hate that phrase because it really means physical distancing, but we need not be going apart from one another in terms of our social bonds. So anyway, uh, how do we get to this? Well, before I go into that, let me flag one important threat. There may be actually a threat of a worse normal. Why? Because in many cases, uh, people are beginning to say, well, why do you have to look at all these environmental regulations? It's only raised the cost of doing business. And so true enough, President Donald Trump has set aside about 100 or so environmental rules on the reasoning that it will make it harder for business to recover if you still have these regulations. In the country, in our own country, what has bothered me tremendously, and I and my friend Bu Chanko have written about it recently, is the way this insertion into the Arise Bill and now even the Bayanihan, Bayanihan 2 Bill of a provision that will tie the hands of the Philippine Competition Commission against acting on mergers and acquisitions that are less than 50 billion. So it, it, the limit goes up to 50 billion. And in short, this really gives us the risk of having even more concentrated monopolies and cartels in the post-COVID scenario, rather than have a more inclusive and a more, uh, shall we say, democratic economy. So towards shaping the new normal, let me just quickly run through this. Again, farm diversification and agri-industrialization is something Secretary Dar is indeed already pursuing. They congest Metro Manila, and one way to do that is try to rechannel the traffic away from the Manila port into the now uh, world standard Batangas and Subic ports. Of course, our internet has to be improved. I'd like to stress aiming for zero hunger as a national and local policy. I think many of you know how my, I, I've been advocating against stunting or severe malnutrition in young children because it's damaging our next generation. On uh, social protection, the national ID is something that is seen to be very important. We need to have investments in hospital modernization, broadening healthcare systems, including these uh, clinics that are more uh, dispersed in the countryside. And then of course, our universal healthcare system. Toward greater sustainability, I have already mentioned how we need to plan on moving further inland, but also into our waters because we're an archipelagic country where the bulk of our wealth is actually in our waters rather than our land. And then they overhaul the public transport system, foster more sustainable lifestyles. But again, my favorite here is more social bonding. And what I mean by that is in the context of the farms, we can foster more farm and fishery clustering via cooperatives, nucleus estates, block farms to gain economies of scale for our very fragmented farm structure now. And second, in, in our neighborhoods, foster strengthened neighborhood and community associations so that we can maintain in close social contact, even if we have to physically distance ourselves for now. So I just wanna end with that message about agriculture. Agriculture saved the economy from even worse decline during the second quarter. And so that reinforces my long held belief that we must really look to agriculture as the, the economy's ultimate backbone, COVID or no COVID. Maraming salamat po. <laughs>